everyone with the slightest interest in education knows about the Chicago miracle in elementary and secondary school education and the people most responsible for bringing it about. It is the miracle produced by the mayor of the city of Chicago together with Gary Chico and our honored guest here today. For our guest today, life looks very promising. Our guest today has an intimate knowledge of the dynamics and inner workings of city, state, and federal government. Integrity, experience, leadership, budgetary and revenue expertise, the courage to make tough, pressure-packed decisions quickly in adverse situations, national acclaim and accomplishment, and the ability to manage a huge bureaucracy. These are qualities rare to be found in one person, but they do describe our speaker. Our guest today sounds like an ideal candidate for governor. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the Chief Executive Officer of the Chicago Public Schools, Paul Ballas. Paul? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Just when I thought I was going to put controversy to rest. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you, Jay. I, I appreciate the invitation. It's, you could have informed my wife first, but, uh, but uh, uh, one person who wasn't recognized, and it's only because I have the responsibility and the obligation uh, to do that, is my wife, uh, Sharon Vallis. So, Sharon, come on, stand up. Yes. Even people like me have nice partners, yes, believe it or not. Now, this is the person who has to live with me and put up with everything that I bring home, and I bring home plenty, so uh, it's just great for her to be here. I tried to get her to stay home. I said, it's going to be non-controversial. Nothing's going to happen. She says, well, I don't want to read anything in the newspaper that you haven't told me about yet, so that's why she's here today. Um, Jay is great about recognizing all the people who need to be recognized because he does it for two reasons. First of all, he's smart, and secondly, he, this allows the uh, speaker to get off the hook, so I certainly appreciate that, but um, I do want to take this moment and, and ju just to uh, once again re-acknowledge Don Clark Nets, who I worked for for about six, seven years in the legislature, and Art Berman, who uh, gave me my start when I staffed the Elementary Secondary Education Committee, so they'll stand up one more time. And uh, come on, Art. Great. Also, I'd like the staff of the Chicago Public Schools. Uh, the, you know, it's, uh, this has always been a team effort. The mayor always has the ability to put excellent teams together. Uh, consistently, and I, I really like all the uh, uh, chiefs and the department has to stand up for a second and get a round of applause too. Could you please one more time? I did that for two reasons. One reason is to recognize them. A second reason is to demonstrate that not everybody here is a Chicago Public School employee. Okay. <laughs> also, uh, someone who was. Uh, Jay, Jay is, is magnificent about doing this, but he always misses at least one person. And it's only because uh, uh, this is such a great gathering. And I'd, uh, you know, we don't move forward unless we have a spectacular board. And the board has been supportive. Uh, we've worked in partnership. Of course, Gary has taken his well-deserved retirement. But there's seven, six other board members who uh, play a critical role. And the, the vice chair, the vice president of the uh, board of trustees, Avis Lavelle. If Avis will stand up too, please. Thank you. Well, what I'd like to do today is uh, to bore you by uh, talking about the state of the schools, where we are today, and in effect, where we need to go in the future. Uh, and 
Uh, I'm going to put my uh, academician's glasses on for a second and really talk numbers because uh, I really want to give you a status report. As you know, this is we're completing our sixth year since the mayor took responsibility for the schools. We just introduced a budget uh, that we will be uh, uh, considering uh, and uh, hopefully will be voted on in June. Uh, and uh, what a difference six years make. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about um, uh, where we are today financially, where we are capital-wise, where we are safety-wise, and where we are in the all-important academic uh, area, and then really talk about uh, what yet needs to be done and where we need to go and some of the obstacles and some of the potential uh, that we face in the future. Let me start off by talking about finances. We just uh, introduced to the board our seventh consecutive balanced budget, and uh, this is our third structurally balanced budget. And as you know, this budget uh, has generated some controversy because we're going to the property tax cap again, like every single school district in the state of Illinois does, year in, year out, routine without controversy. But it's also a uh, somewhat of a controversial budget because we're uh, closing 400 positions. But let me point out that uh, one of the things that uh, we've been able to do at the schools is to bring long-term financial stability to the system. And in government, if you don't have your financial health, you don't have anything. Everything proceeds from the finances. Uh, if we have, if we uh, are slashing budgets left and right, if we have financial problems, if we can't pay for union contracts, if we can't pay for vendors, if we can't continue to finance our support programs, then in effect, we have a dysfunctional system. And we all remember the days not so long ago when getting through the year with a balanced budget was considered to be an accomplishment, or getting through the year without a teacher strike was considered to be an accomplishment. Well, you know, what a difference six years make. The budget we introduced today is our seventh consecutive balanced budget, and it is a structurally balanced budget. And although we close 400 positions in the schools, we also create 536 new teaching positions, not to mention the 300 class size reduction positions that we uh, began to uh, uh, create uh, uh, in second semester of this year and which will be made permanent this year. So in effect, in effect, what we're doing with this budget is we're creating over 800 permanent new teaching positions in the Chicago public school system so we can at least keep class size where it is and do some targeted class size reduction. But this budget is balanced. Uh, uh, it maintains our reserves, which in effect means that uh, over the next two to three years, we'll continue to have financial, the financial stability uh, that we've enjoyed the last three or four years. What we do in the Chicago public schools is we do long-term budgeting. And every budget we work on today is designed to be balanced three or four years down the road. So, you know, you're not going to wake up one morning and suddenly discover that we can't open schools or we can't provide supplies or we can't hire the teachers that we need to hire to fill uh, the vacancies created uh, by our mandate to maintain class size at a certain amount and by uh, the fact that our enrollment continues to increase. So this budget is solid and uh, we anticipate that the budget hopefully will be approved. Uh, and uh, you can rest assured that the financial foundation of the system will remain solid. Let me talk about capital. Five years ago, six years ago, uh, we all remember the McClure Report, where the McClure Report determined that only 10% of the schools in the city of Chicago were considered to be in good condition. The rest were in fair or unsatisfactory con condition. Well, t uh, today, six years later, we have 500 renovated school buildings. We have 71 new schools, additions, and annexes. And for anyone who would think for a second, because we've heard the rhetoric about how maybe we're creating schools or we're building schools to just benefit one group or another, 86% of the children who attend those new schools in those new buildings are minority children. 84% are eligible for the free lunch program, meaning that we've basically put money where there has been the greatest need. So the bottom line for us is, is um, uh, just drive through any neighborhood and look at the renovated buildings. Uh, people are amazed when they come and they visit us uh, from uh, outside our school districts, amazed at the fact that they look at buildings that don't have boarded up windows, or they look at uh, shiny new annexes and additions. And the buildings that we're building today are built to last. You know, under the leadership of Tim Martin and his operations crew, uh, we have literally built 71 new schools, additions, and annexes at only 5.5% change orders which even by industry standards is considered to be quite an achievement. So that means when we budget for a school, we build it. And that school is built, and that build, school is built within the contract specifications. And when you look at our new school buildings, whether you're looking at Northside College Prep 
or the renovated Mendel campus, Southside College Prep, or Van Glissagen in Roseland, or the new Brunson School in Austin, you're looking at a building that's going to be there 100 years from now. They're not going to be like the old Willis buildings, built to last 15 years, and we're still using them 30, 35 years later. These buildings are going to be built to last. You know, we're building them like the pyramids. Where would we be today? Yeah, well, some of us will, yeah, we won't be buried in them, rest assured. <laughs> but where would we be, where would we build, where would we be today had not uh, those uh, builders prior to World War II not built the Lane Techs and the Fangers and the Roosevelts the way they built those buildings? To build a new Lane Tech today would cost us $125 million. Uh, we are fortunate that those buildings prior to World War II were built so solidly because all we've needed to do is to go in and renovate them. In addition, on the technology side, every single one of our high schools will be fully wired and interneted with virtually every single classroom fully wired and interneted by the start of the school year next year. Find me another big city school district that can boast that. And two-thirds of the elementary schools will have, most, will have their wiring and internet work completely done with 10 fully wired and interneted classrooms. We've got about a third more to go. Uh, we're not miracle workers, but we're getting there. But the bottom line is there has been a complete capital, physical renovation, physical transformation of the school system. And don't make, don't make any mistake about it. There is a direct correlation between a student behavior and student academic performance and the quality of the building. Walk around, drive around the city of Chicago, look at our school buildings, look for the graffiti, you won't find it. Look for the broken windows, you won't find it. When you build a majestic building or rehab one of our old majestic buildings in our neighborhoods, it tells young children in that community that this is important. We all remember when we were kids, we look at that. What, what impressed us? Things that were big and shiny. Our schools are big and shiny. So the kids know that. The kids know that the educational institutions are a thing of importance because they look so big and they look so shiny. You know, five years ago, 90% uh, of our schools had what we call the, well, the Lexon windows. My mother calls them glaucoma windows because she says the longer you have them, the less you can see out of them. <laughs> Today, 350 of those schools have glass windows. And if there's a direct correlation between sunlight and improved academic performance, maybe that's it. Maybe that's the reason that the kids are getting better. But the bottom line is the physical transformation uh, has been occurring and we've has had significant results. Let me talk about public safety. You know, we did a series of surveys, uh, and we do them regularly. Mike McEwen does uh, uh, a number of customer service surveys in our schools. He surveys teachers, he surveys parents to get a sense of what they think about certain programs and get a sense about what they think the priorities are. In the recent survey we did of teacher concerns, only 3% considered safety to be a concern. Maybe it's because the schools have safety plans these days and metal detectors, and maybe it's because we have a tough zero tolerance policy which requires uh, dangerous children to be transferred not to the street but to alternative schools. But the bottom line is we have maybe half the incidents, the assaults and batteries that we had five, six years ago. And where 10 years ago they used to confiscate 20, uh, maybe t as many as 150 to 200 firearms in the schools, I think today our number was, what, 16, and that's in 601 schools. And let me tell you, 16 firearms, there's 16 firearms too many. But when you see that dramatic a reduction, that means children are getting the message. So the schools are safe. The schools are safer than they have been in the past. And while it's impossible for us to maintain, to make sure that all of our schools are 100% safe, I don't think there's any school district in the nation that can boast that or can guarantee that. The bottom line is the schools are safe zones and they are considered safe havens for children and children are much more comfortable going to those schools than ever before. I remember five, six years ago, five, six years ago when we uh, would do when we first came in, we would do our shakedown inspections where we we go in and we check every student coming into the school, book bags, everything, just complete locker checks, everything. And I remember a certain school on the southwest side, I think there were like 120 students who had violated our, uh, our policies, either bringing, uh, e either bringing pagers in or I think there were 22 weapons. That same school we checked last year, I think there were three pagers and one pocket knife. Okay, remember five years ago when we did do Sabo, I think there were 25 weapons five years ago that we confiscated in do Sabo. I think there were one or two firearms and the rest were knives and, and, and uh, box cutters. Last year when we did our, our periodic check, which we do of certain schools, when we did do Sabo, I think we found uh, 
I think we found two pagers uh, and, uh, and one pocket phone in that whole school. Go out to any suburban school, you're going to find a heck of a lot more than that. So the bottom line is the schools are safer and the schools are more secure. Let me talk about labor management. You know, we, people have been telling me, oh, there's a change in union leadership. What does that mean? It doesn't mean anything because at the end of the day, uh, anyone who heads the Chicago Teachers Union are going to put the interests of children first. And the new president of the Chicago Teachers Union has not done anything to suggest uh, that she's going to deviate from that central uh, tenet that our responsibility is to uh, reach, reach agreements that are in the best interest of children. And we certainly look forward to working with her. But I like to think that we've broken the mold when it comes to dealing with labor unions. Look, I've been budget director, revenue director. I've gone through numerous changes in union leadership. And you know, things always end up, look, end up OK. Uh, the bottom line is we've gone beyond the brinksmanship when it comes to negotiation with our unions. We deal with our unions monthly. We strategic bargain monthly. And that concept of, of establishing good working relationships with the leaders of all of our unions uh, is something that's going to continue. And I look forward to the same uh, good, cordial working relationship with the new head of the teachers union uh, as we've had with past unions and as we have with our other unions. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're not going to deviate from that. And if you would look, and if you've looked at the surveys that the consortium of school reform have done or Mike have done of teachers and teacher attitudes about things like high academic standards and ending the social promotions and, and the, uh, and the uh, structured curriculum supports that they receive, uh, you will see that anywhere between 70 to 80 percent of the teachers uh, are supportive and feel supportive of these initiatives. So we look forward to working with the new union leadership, and we think that this new labor management relationship that we've established with all our, of our unions are going to continue, are going to continue for the, with the best interests of the schools. So I've talked about the status of finance. I've talked about the status of capital. I've talked about the status of safety and labor management. Let me talk for a second academics. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, we rise and fall on our ability to improve the performance of the children in the city of Chicago. So let me give you kind of a picture of the academic performance of the system. Uh, five years ago, six years ago actually, only 26% of our kids were reading or computing at or above national averages in the elementary schools. Today that's 38%. In, the, uh, in math, it went from, it's gone from 28 to 44%. In the high schools, it's gone from 20 to 32% in reading and from 21 to 45% in math. Now, those scores are still far too low, and we've admitted them, and as you know, the mayor looks at the glass half full, as, I mean half empty as opposed to half full, and that's the way we look at it. But let's look beyond the straight cut scores, because when we look at a cut score, 8.8 .8 is the cut score that you should be at at the end of eighth grade to be at grade level. Well, if you're at 8.7, then technically you're considered to be below grade level. Let's look at the kids. Let's look at the kids far below grade level and let's look at the progress that they've made. Test scores are divided into four quartiles. Five years ago, almost half of the kids in this school system were performing in the bottom quartile. That means they weren't even close to grade level. Today, that percentage has literally been cut almost in half, depending on the subject area. In other words, we've gone from, we've gone from, uh, we've gone from 43 percent of our elementary school children reading or computing in the bottom quartile to 28 percent. 52 percent of our high school children reading or computing at the bottom quartile to 27 percent. The bottom line is the percentage of students at the lowest performing love, uh, level have left the bottom quartile and they've moved to the third quartile, which means they're approaching grade level. So that means that while we still do not have a large number of children at that cut score, the number of children a month or two months or three months below that cut score is significantly higher. Educators measure academic performance by the use of stay nines. This is what they do. This is how they measure it. And it doesn't look at a strict cut score to say, oh, you're at above or you're, but what it does is it provides like a three to four month range. It divides all of your academic scorecard into nine stay nines, and the fifth stay nine is considered to be smack dab in the middle. Five years ago, only 36 percent of our students were at the fifth stay nine or above. Today, 52, 53 percent of those students are at the fifth stay nine or above at the elementary school level. So that represents progress. Progress is being made, and certainly it's not being made fast enough to satisfy any of us, 
But the bottom line is progress is being made, and it has been consistent, and it's across the board. Now, let me give you some other indicators. Our attendance rates have never been higher. Our, drop, our uh, uh, truancy rates have never been lower. Our dropout rate has declined for three consecutive years. Our graduation rates have gone from about 60 percent to they're pushing 67, 68 percent. And we, identify, and we suspect that it will be higher this year. Now, why the graduation rate seems to be higher than the dropout rate because we re-enroll dropouts. Today, we have 30 evening schools in the Chicago Public Schools, and we will graduate 2,600 kids from those evening schools, where five years ago, we graduated 80. So students are re-enrolling, and they're graduating. So at the end of the day, the number of graduates are far outstripping the dropouts because the dropouts are simply re-enrolling and not being counted again. So the bottom line here for us is we're seeing improvement across the board. And let's look beyond this because a lot of times the focus is on the underachieving children. A big mistake that is made in public education is to become, is to ignore children who are at grade level or above and to make sure that all of those schools have the challenges and the challenging programs that are going to, that are going to help them move to the next level. Because we've heard the, the, the concept of academically segregating our children. Well, today we have twice as many children in advanced placement and honors programs as we've ever had before. Just, in, just three years ago, 1,900 kids were in AP courses. Today, close to 4,000 kids are in AP courses. And that doesn't count the 1,500 kids that actually take college courses for dual credit before they graduate. Uh, five years ago, 27% of all of our top achieving students exited this school system and sought education elsewhere. Today, or last year, that had declined to 15%. We think that that's going to decline again. And that decline is across all social, economic, racial, and ethnic groups. So by every indicator, the school system is improving. It's not improving as fast as we'd like it to improve, but the bottom line is the school system is improving. And let me make a comment about this year's test scores. This year's test scores, we saw our sixth consecutive year of improved reading scores. And if you look at the NAEP exams or any of these national exams, the stories that you've seen in U.S. World and News and some of the other newspapers have been reading scores flat, no improvement in reading scores. Well, our scores have gone up six consecutive years. And when the Iowa test is renormed later on this month, the scores will probably bump another 2 to 3 percent with the biggest increase anticipated to come at the much maligned third grade reading level. This year, at the elementary school levels, our math scores dipped after five years of about 3 to 4 percent improvement every year. They dipped by 2 percent. We're not satisfied with it, but it's the first dip in six years. At the high school level, much attention drawn to the fact that the kids did worse than the TAP than they did last year. Well, we're phasing out the TAP. For the last three years, I've taken a beating over my reliance on the Iowa test of basic skills, particularly in the high schools. And for the last two years, we've been shifting to an ACT series test, the plan, the explorer, and the ACT. So this year, the kids, in effect, took the tap for what is probably going to be the last time. And we instead uh, gave the kids, for the first time, the explorer and the plan. And you know what? The kids on the explorer and the plan, which are ACT prep exams, in reading did far better than they've ever done on the TAP exam in reading. Now, we'll have to wait until next year to see whether or not that's reason for rejoice. But if you would have told us that uh, uh, last year, before our kids took the uh, sophomore ACT prep exam, the plan that 52 percent of the kids would have basically met or exceeded national norms in reading, you know, I would have asked you if you were inhaling. So the bottom line is uh, the school system is showing improvement. And in our case exams, our standard-based assessment ex exams, in all seven of the math and science categories, the kids did better in every single category. But that doesn't work its way into the news. Those are complicated issues. Uh, but, but at the end of the day, the schools are showing additional improvement and are showing additional progress. And we're certainly pleased with that. We want to see faster progress, but the progress definitely is there. And, and we're satisfied, and, and, and we're, I don't want to say we're satisfied, but we're, we're heartened by some of the results that we're seeing. So, uh, so overall, if you look on the academic side, the school system is moving forward. And let me tell you, it's moving forward with a much more rigorous system of standards and curriculum. Five years ago, you could graduate from the Chicago Public Schools with one year of math or two years of science, or two years of math and one year of science. 
You didn't have to take geometry. You didn't have to take algebra. You didn't have to take physics. You didn't have to take chemistry. You didn't have to take algebra trig. Let's see, when I went to Fangor, I think I took algebra. No geometry, no chemistry, no physics, no algebra trig. That was 25 years ago or 30 years ago in the good old days, OK? Today, you have to go, every single student has to go through a college preparatory curriculum. Five years ago, only 5,200 kids took pure chemistry. This year, 33,000 kids took chemistry. Five years ago, 14,000 kids took pure algebra. This year, 32,000 kids took pure algebra. Five years ago, 7,000 kids took physics. This year, 15,000 children took physics. So our kids are responding and doing better despite the fact that the standards are being raised and that the curriculum requirements are being intensified. And five years ago, in this school system, you had limited options. Five years ago, if you didn't want to go to your neighborhood school, particularly your neighborhood high school, you were stuck. You either had to go parochial, private, or, you, or maybe you would try to test your luck with the lottery, or in the case of Whitney Young, try, test your academic luck, and you would try to get into one of the five citywide magnet high schools. So it was either five magnets, neighborhood, or bust. Well, today, children literally have 30 to 40 options. Visit any elementary school in the city of Chicago, go into that eighth grade class, and ask that eighth grade class, where are you going to high school? And if you don't, if, if you don't get eight different schools mentioned, I'll give you 100 bucks. Because children have options. They can apply to one of the 10 citywide magnet high schools. They can apply to one of literally 40 city neighborhood magnet programs, 15 international baccalaureate programs in the neighborhood schools, or the military academy programs that are in the neighborhood schools, or the math, science, and technology academy programs that are in the neighborhood schools, or the 12 world language academy uh, uh, programs that are in the neighborhood schools. You can actually attend high school in the city of Chicago and take four years of Mandarin Chinese for mastery. So literally, so you're not stuck. So while we're working to improve the quality of the schools, we're also expanding the options available to all, all children so that when they enter high school, they're not simply stuck. They're not stuck with that neighborhood school. Or ch although chances are that neighborhood school has one or two magnet programs of their own. So the bottom line is there has never been more options available to children. And while not all the options are superlative and, and uh, not all the options are, are on par with, uh, with some of the elite magnet schools, the options provide viable alternatives and choice in this school system. And I haven't even, even gotten into the charters, which uh, this year are showing significant improvement. It looks like the charter experiment is showing a lot of potential. So there are school options. And that is the status and that is the situation on the academic side. We've made a lot of progress. We've expanded more options uh, uh, than ever before. Children have choice at the high school level. But at the end of the day, we're not going to be satisfied until all of our schools are performing at national norm or, or above. So let me talk to you about the challenges that remain. Let me talk to you about finances. And then I'll open it up to questions. On the finance side, what do we need to do to maintain this level of stability? We are in a position in the Chicago Public Schools where as long as we get about a 3 to 4 percent growth in our state funding every year, we can continue to maintain what we have and in some cases continue to improve upon what we have. Expanded after school, expanded early childhood, expanded summer school. There was a day where this system needed a bailout every three or four years. And you know, the way the legislature used to bail us out in the old days, Don will tell you this or Otto will tell you this, they used to come in and they used to issue deficit financing bonds, okay? That means they used to issue these 15, 20 year deficit financing bonds, raise the money, and the money would provide for a two-year bailout. It's like, it's like uh, f cutting off a starving man's arm and feeding it to him, OK? Really, I'm still paying off the deficit financing bonds that were issued in 1979 and 1993 for those bailouts. No more deficit financing bonds. We turned the deficit financing bond levies into our capital levies. That's what's helping fuel this uh, capital school expansion. Pat knows that too, right? You know about the deficit financing bonds. In the case of Chicago, they cut off both arms, OK? <laughs> cut off an arm in 979, they cut off one in 93. All right, thank God they didn't get started on the legs. But, but, so today we are in a position where if we just get our fair share from Springfield, we have a comfort level. We have a financial comfort level. That's why when we go down there, we don't, you know, we ask, just getting our fair share, getting our 23, 24%, 22%. You know, there's different perspectives of fair share down in Springfield. 
uh, we, can, we can continue to make progress. But let me tell you, the state pot is getting smaller and smaller because increasingly that 51% is including pension contributions. And that pension obligation at the state level continues to grow. So when you look at that 51% of all new state funding going to elementary, secondary education uh, and, and higher education, and you look at that $303 million that is being made available at the state level, subtract out about $90 million in pension contributions because the 51% includes the state's increasing contribution to the, to the downstate teachers' retirement system, of which we in Chicago don't get a penny. But we're in a position to continue to move along because we have financial stability, because we have structurally balanced budgets, because we have our finances under control. But I will tell you this, if you want to get to the next level, it's going to take a lot more commitment than just 51% minus the pension contribution. We all know that if we reach children earlier, and if we keep kids in school longer, and if we, and if we spend more money in professional development, and if we reduce class size, you're going to see academic improvement. But that's not going to come without a real financial commitment to increase funding. And that's not only an issue for us, but it's an issue for everybody in the state. People talk about professional development. To take one day off in a school, and to keep everybody at that school, for a whole day to do professional development costs $20,000. Now you know the cost of professional development. So we'll continue to move along, but at the end of the day, if we're going to talk about class size reduction, and we're going to talk about expanded early childhood programs, and if we're going to talk about, if we're going to talk about things like massive, extensive professional development, it's going to take a much larger commitment on the part of the state, and it's going to take a much larger commitment on the part of the federal government uh, than we are currently seeing. And that's just the reality of that. Now let me talk about capital. We have spent about $3 billion, or have in line to spend $3 billion in school construction and repairs. And there is no final, finer administered capital construction program than we have in the city of Chicago. Tim Martin has done a miracle, has pulled off a miracle on what he's done on the capital side in his management of the system. And he takes a lot of flack for it. Everybody thinks he's me because they say, well, Mr. Vallis is a big, tall guy. And he has glasses, so Tim goes out there and he thinks he's me, so he gets really beat up when he's out there. <laughs> All right? And when you're this tall, they don't notice that there's a hair differential. <laughs> then I'm suffering from a severe hair deficit. But, but we still have about a billion and a half more to go. And you know, we can wait for the state to come through and we can wait for the federal government to come through. But the bottom line is there is a quick solution in Springfield for us right now. There are two bills that do nothing but give us control over our resources and our own fair share of resources. My philosophy in Springfield has always been to go down, keep, you know, get our books in order, get our finances in order, and then go down and get my fair share. Three rules you follow. Number one, you don't ask for anything that other people don't already have. Number two, you don't ask for anything that the state can't afford to give you. And number three, you don't ask for anything you don't deserve. So those are the rules. Call them the Vallis rules. Call them the Vallis Chico rules. Call them the Vallis Chico daily rules. But those are the rules we apply when we, when we have our Springfield strategy. So we've been pursuing two pieces of legislation. The first piece would be for the state to give us our share of the pension appropriation that they give to the downstate teachers' retirement system. Now, I'm getting into the technical area, and if people start snoozing, I'm going to pull the button here. But, uh, but uh, five, six years ago, our school system always got about 25% of all the money that goes into the downstate teachers' retirement system. And five years, six years ago, they stopped increasing our contribution. So we get $65 million from the state today, and we got $65 million from the state six years ago. The downstate teachers got $235 million from the state six years ago, and they get $800 million from the state today, almost $2 billion more into the downstate teacher, teachers' retirement system. Now, let me tell you how that impacts on us. The more money the state puts in, the less money I put in. The less money I put in, the more money I have for class size reduction and for school construction and repairs. So I've been asking for the last five years for 20% of whatever the downstate teachers get, the increases, not the old money, the increases, 18 million a year. What could I do with 18 million a year? With 18 million a year, I could issue bonds, amortize the interest, and raise a billion dollars in two years to come close to finishing the school, school construction, uh, uh, the school construction challenges that we're facing in the school system. Our money, 
We're all eight. It's a fifty billion dollar budget. I can't get that bill through. Five years I've been trying to get that bill through. I can't get it through. So I go with the backup plan. The backup plan is to uh, Senate Bill 22. That bill would allow us to adjust our school construction capital levy to the cap. It's about three and a half million a year. It's about a buck fifty, buck seventy-five. Okay. That bill would allow me to issue enough bonds, amortize the interest, and raise about half a billion dollars in school construction bonds. And if we have that money and the federal government passes the Johnson Wrangle bill, the tax subsidy bill, that could, that could translate into about a billion dollars because anything that the president passes in the era of school construction is going to be the form, in the form of tax incentive, interest subsidies. You're going to have to issue debt to, in, in order to get the subsidies. That, that bill is held up in committee. It's held up in the House right now. The speaker supports it. The minority leader opposes it. He's told Republicans, arrows down. Why? Because that bill is on a bill that provides downstate districts with the ability to adjust their property tax levy for, its, for its, uh, school health safety initiatives. So if they have a health safety crisis or an asbestos crisis or a lead abatement crisis and they can't raise money, through a referendum, they can at least make a slight adjustment in their levy to generate enough money to pass that. But that's a violation of the cap. You impose a cap, but we don't give the schools the money to compensate them or to replace the money that they can't raise locally. So those two bills, in effect, would give us enough money to, to complete the remaining two-thirds, at least two-thirds of what remains to be done on the academic side. And those two bills are in Springfield, and hopefully in the next two or three days, one of those bills will be cut loose. But that's what we need to build the additional 50 new schools, additions, and annexes that we need to build in order to complete the job, or to complete the renovations of our high schools that we've begun the last three years, or to build the five new high schools that we need to build throughout the city of Chicago. This isn't just a Pilsen Little Village High School. This is a back of the arts high school, a new Tilden High School, a new Harper High School in Englewood, a new Westinghouse High School. The kids are still in the Westinghouse factory. So there's a lot of physical needs. And we're not asking for anything that downstate doesn't have. Downstate can raise their capital levy to the cap. We're not asking for anything that the state can't afford to give us. $18 million in a $50 billion budget is nothing. And we're not asking for anything that other people don't already have. The downstate teachers get $90 million a year increases in the downstate teachers' retirement system. We're entitled to a small portion, a small share. But then let me talk about what we need to do on the academic side. You know, I keep on hearing early childhood education, class size reduction, uh, extensive professional development. All for it. You for class size, you know, I, I hear it all the time. Well, they're not going to improve the schools until they reduce class sizes. Great. I want world peace too. But, you know, you've got to have the means in order to get it done. We're reducing class size at the primary grade level. Primary grade alone by five students costs about $60 million. Reducing class size in all the elementary schools costs $120 million. I'm lucky, I'm lucky if I get half that in increases a year from the legislature. The bottom line is class size reduction is going to continue to be a targeted effort until we get until the state makes a much larger commitment uh, to funding education. The same thing with early childhood. We have double, literally doubled the size of our early childhood programs in the city of Chicago. We have We've increased, we have uh, a daycare, preschool, state pre-K. We probably increased by, cl I think, close to 20,000 the number of children in early childhood programs in the city of Chicago. We even have a program in the high schools called the Cradle to the Classroom, where we identify every single pregnant teen. We put the pregnant teen in a parenting program, assign them a parent advocate, and, and, uh, and the goal here is to keep the pregnant teen in school and to make sure the baby's born healthy and the baby gets into daycare and early childhood programs. We've had over 4,000 pregnant teens go through that program this year, or in the past three years. I think we've had one dropout and one repeat pregnancy. It's the best dropout prevention, pregnancy prevention program that we have. So we're doing, we're doing these things. But if we're going to get to the next level, it's going to require a much greater state commitment. The state, I, I think less than, you know, less than 3, 4 percent of the education budget goes to uh, children under the age of five, and yet they constitute about one third one-third of the children in our, you know, in our system. We've got to get all of our children in early childhood programs, and we've got to get real class size reduction, just not the targeted class size reduction in the 200 uh, lowest performing schools that we've attempted to target resources for. Because 
cl clearly that is going to allow us to make the greatest gains. Uh, and that's going to allow us to move the system along the fastest. But that said and done, we're not using that as an excuse for the failure of continued improvement. The school system is going to continue to improve. And why? Because the school system is now on high standards and children are rising to the standards. Bec the school system remains a system that demands accountability of everybody in the schools. Everyone is held responsible for the, uh, for the performance of the children. The teachers, the parents, the principals, there is an accounting, there is a price to pay uh, for the failure of that school to academically perform. And we're going to continue to spend our money in support programs like the Cradle to the Classroom and Early Childhood and After School and Summer School where we can to make a difference. These three standards, accountability and support are going to be, you know, you know are going to continue to be uh, the key components of our drive to move the school system forward. But if we're going to get to the next level ourselves, we have got to we have got to concentrate on certain areas that are within our control. We have got to make sure that every single school is using a quality curriculum. We've got to make sure that the schools have a curriculum strategy. We've got to make sure that our teachers are trained to that curriculum. We've got to make sure that there are people in the schools that are monitoring curriculum and instruction and that are assessing and that are evaluating and providing the support for what the teachers need. In the past, We've done this in a general way, but now we're beginning to do it in a more assertive way, even with the implications on uh, the infringement of local control. Because at the end of the day, even the poor schools, if they have a curriculum strategy and the teachers are trained to that curriculum and committed to that curriculum, and if all the support programs support that curriculum, and if they have somebody in that school, a a reading coordinator and a math coordinator helping the teachers and assisting the teachers along, that school is going to move forward. So one of our initiatives in this year's budget is our CASA program where we're taking 200 of the, of the lowest performing elementary schools and we're in effect telling them that we're going to come in. We're going to make sure that you're using a structured curriculum and, and we're going to give you curriculum options. We're going to make sure that we give you what professional development resources we can afford so that all of your teachers are trained to that curriculum. We're going to make sure that you've got a coordinator to help you on curriculum and assessment. And we're going to make sure that you've got the professional development time and the in-service training time so that you can all get together and you can all strategize. And that's the approach that we're taking in the elementary schools. In the high schools, similar approach. We've divided all of our high schools into six high school regions now. And we have teams that are going to handle 15 high schools apiece for the professed purpose of just making sure that all the schools are getting the curriculum and instructional support that they need uh, to move the schools forward. Our high schools have made progress, but our high schools still need to make a lot more progress. And for students that are academically struggling once they enter high school, we're in effect in the ninth and 10th grades going to be clearing away their curriculum requirements and, and we're going to be requiring that they take double the math periods and double the language arts periods and double the science periods so that they can master the core curriculum subject areas before they move to that, to that next grade level. But, you know, make no bones about it. Uh, it's going to take a much larger commitment at the state level and at the federal level uh, if we're going to get, you know, if we're going to move to the next level of where we need to be. And every single year, it's a struggle for us to go down there and literally to lobby for, you know, just our fair share of resources when the state has got to be focusing on the much broader financial obligations. They have got to be making a much larger commitment to elementary and secondary education. But, uh, and we're going to need to continue to expand options in our neighborhood schools. Our strategy has been to break the isolation that exists within our neighborhood schools. In the old days, you can't get your kids into the, if you get your kids into the magnet schools, you won the lottery. If you can't get them into the magnet schools, you're stuck with that neighborhood school. Well, one of the things that we tried to do the last five or six years is to make sure that all of our neighborhood schools become magnet-like. One of the reasons that we've embarked upon a program of putting magnet programs in neighborhood schools is so that every single school has exemplary programs. Every single school has advanced placement programs. Every single school has one or two magnet programs that they can, that they can brag about, that, they can, that can help give that school an identity. Five years ago, you couldn't get anybody to go to Curry High School. Today, you've got 2,000 applicants a year. They want to go to Curry. Curry is, has a college preparatory curriculum, but they also have an international baccalaureate program, and they have a, a career education program, and they have a performing arts program. 
Five, six years ago, you couldn't get anybody from the Beverly community to go to Morgan Park. The kids from Chatham went to Morgan Park. That's how Morgan, pa Morgan Park was able, because they didn't want to go to Harlan. Now, 2,000 applicants last year to Morgan Park. Why? Because not only does Morgan Park have a college preparatory curriculum like all of our high schools, but Morgan Park has an international baccalaureate program. Morgan Park has a world language academy program. They have, uh, which includes an international travel component. You all remember, I mean, you remember when I, the, the, right, the Spanish teacher left a kid in Spain, remember that? I love those problems, I love those problems. I'll take that over a gun in the school problem any day. You know, I mean, great. There was actually an editorial saying that I needed to review the international travel program. That, what a great advertisement, you know? We should put that in all of our brochures. A Morgan Park, but not only those programs, Morgan Park has an, they have a four-year advanced technology program uh, with Cisco as their external partner. So nobody, if so, you know, you don't have to wait to get into Whitney Young or to, you don't have to wait to get into Southside College Prep. You've got a magnet school right in your own community. And it's just not limited to Morgan Park. You go up north where you look at the improvements of Roosevelt or Mather or uh, Sen or Amitz in both schools of which have IB programs. You work your, or, or you look at Prosser and Steinmetz or Bogan or Hubbard and you just go through a whole host of schools that have a, have a multiplicity of program offerings for our children. So what we're doing is, what we're doing is while, while we struggle to continue to improve our schools across the system. We're expanding options and we're giving children more choices so children can vote with their feet and the parents can vote with their feet and so that we've got competition within the school system. And we're gonna continue to do that. But obviously the more resources we have, uh, the, our, that's gonna, that will enable us to do those things faster. So those are the things that we have done. That, that's the status of our schools. And that's where we need to go into the future. Just to summarize, financially, uh, you know, I don't think we've ever been better off financially. But once again, balance today, broke tomorrow. Uh, our, the, the, budget that we, the budget that we pass on in June uh, will be a budget that will guarantee over the next three to four years that the system uh, uh, maintains its financial stability, which is so critical to academic performance. Capital, you see, but if we're gonna continue to move the, 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 the finances forward, we need to continue to fund to fight for fair funding in Springfield. On the capital side, two thirds of the job is done. We wanna finish the job. Help us pass Senate Bill 22 and help us pass the pension funding bill. And believe me, uh, we'll be able to come close to finishing the job without in any significant way increasing the burden on local property taxpayers. Uh, we're so close and we're not asking for anything other people aren't getting or the state cannot afford to give us. On the academic side, look, this system's gonna continue to improve high standards, uh, accountabilities, our support programs, they're working. Uh, you know, we need to, to work to make sure that all of our schools have a very rigorous structured curriculum, that the teachers have a game plan for educating their children, that they're trained to that game plan, that they're committed to that game plan. Uh, you know, uh, additional focus on curriculum and instruction, on improved professional development is gonna help get us to the next level. But if we're gonna move even faster, we're gonna need to tackle the issue of early, expanded early childhood. We're gonna need to tackle the issue of class size reduction. And we're gonna need to tackle the issue of the state and the universities getting into the business of upgrading their standards and improving uh, uh, the quality of their instruction so that we don't have to be retraining teachers or training teachers that come out of the colleges and universities. We should not have to go through that. We should not have to uh, take a first or second year teacher and put them through training they should, they should be able to enter our school system ready for the challenges of our school system. Uh, look, it's been, an, it's been an interesting six years. Uh, had the mayor not taken responsibility for the schools, uh, we would have been wrestling with the same periodic budget crisis and we wouldn't even be debating academics. Isn't it refreshing to be able to discuss ac academics and to be able to de debate the merits of curriculum models? I remember when I was city budget director or city revenue director, uh, the, the whole discussion was, will they open or will they won't open? Or will they balance the budget or will they won't balance the budget? And we all remember the old days when there wasn't any property tax cap and every single year that there was a reassessment, the board just basically raised that levy to the max. One year, what was it, $120 million, $600 million over five years. I'm still looking for that money, okay? I'm still looking for that, uh, uh, for money generating from that revenue generating capacity. But we've come a long way because this entire city has really focused on education. I mean, had it not been for the mayor, look, the mayor's made education his number one priority. 
That's why every morning you're asking him questions about education. That's why every night you're tracking me down and asking me questions about education. Sometimes calling me at 5.30 in the morning and ask me questions about education. Uh, you know, it's been, it, it's become a number one priority nationally in large part because of what the mayor has, has done here. That's why every mayor is standing in line to try to get the power that the mayor daily has gotten to move the school system forward. We've made a lot of gains, and it's not due to one person or one individual. And we'll continue to make gains, whoever is running the system, because this city has made education in the city of Chicago its number one priority. As long as the city continues to provide the support and to basically uh, make education kind of like the political litmus test for survival in this town, uh, believe me, no one is going to begin neglecting it. I mean, it's great to be debating uh, 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 a new high school in Pilsen Little Village on top of the eight new schools and additions and annexes that have already been built. Five years ago, we hadn't constructed a thing. Five years later, now we're debating whether or not we should build our ninth facility as opposed to our first or second facility. You know what they say? Revolutions occur during periods of rising expectations. Well, that's good. Expectations have been risen. It's been risen because a lot's been accomplished. Uh, and we need to continue to raise the bar in each and every one of us. So, Jay, I'd like to thank you for allowing me to go over time. Uh, I'll open it up to some questions, if some people have questions, but thank you very much. Okay. Some questions? All right. If, um, Anyone, if anyone has a question, if they'll make their way to the mic, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll take a few questions. Jay will cut me off when it's my time. Five minutes. Yes. Mr. Valls, I want to applaud you for the great work that you've done, leadership, the vision that you've had, the commitment. I want you to stay on. I think that you're the kind of person that's looking for a challenge, and I cannot believe that you can find more of a challenge than you have in the Chicago school system. Uh, there. Thank you. There is. Um, all the, all the good work, all the progress, like you said, is, is, is good. We're making progress. We've seen improvement, but we need to do more. And one of the things I was uh, recently had an opportunity to finally read was a report in, in Chicago Sun-Times. I guess it came out in the fall. And it said that four, for African Americans were four times more likely than their white counterparts uh, in, in the third grade to, to read below uh, level. And that caused me some concern. And I'd like to hear you speak to what are the targeted efforts that mm -hmm. are, are currently in place and you think need to be further enhanced to, to address that kind of problem here in Chicago. Okay. Thank you. All right, quickly. Uh, very quickly, first of all, I, I think that was a national study you, you were referring to. Um, what we're doing to, to help target the critical third graders is, well, first of all, there's no substitution for expanding early childhood uh, programs. And because of the shortage of funds to, uh, to have uh, school-based early childhood programs, I, I think we have maybe 60% of the children in early childhood programs that need to be in early childhood programs, I would say by my estimate. So that means about 40% of the kids who are entering the system have had no previous early childhood or early childhood care, and obviously it, it shows. So what we've been attempting to do to close the gap is to have more parental outreach programs, like cradle to the classroom in the high schools, or for that matter, like the Parents as Teachers First program, where we actually send parent advocates into the homes to teach young mothers how to be home preschool instructors themselves. So we're trying to bridge that gap in very cost-effective ways because we don't have a lot of resources. So clearly, I mean, we have got to make a larger commitment to early childhood. And I think that, that when it comes to state aid and when it comes to appropriating for elementary secondary education, they really have got to lower the age to three, the requirements of the educational requirements. In other words, if, if parents want to have educational services for their children at age three, they, there should be public services available for them. And I think that's absolutely critical. That would be a big help to us. The second thing we're doing is, is we are trying to find a way to increase the amount of time on task. Uh, two years ago, we started a program where, whereby all primary grade students who are not at grade level or judged not at grade level, it's more difficult to assess first and second graders, would be required to uh, be put in the after school programs, the lighthouse programs, so that they get additional instruction. All primary school kids, I think beginning last year, uh, were required to attend summer school if they were deemed at being below grade level. So in effect what we do is we're putting all the elementary school children who are academically struggling in an extended day program and in a year-round program because what happens with the very young children is that, you know, a 10-week break does a lot of damage. When you have that 10-week, the same studies have also pointed out that, that uh, 
children who do not get a lot of parental attention at home and a lot of parental support are more apt to lose a lot of their knowledge during that summer break. So let's have less of a summer break for primary school kids. So obviously that's, that's an approach that we're also taking. But then the third approach that we're taking is really to try to revamp our curriculum. You know, in, in the early days of that we were here, we were much less reluctant to go in. We would maybe dictate the standards, but we wouldn't go in and we wouldn't be the curriculum police. Well, now we're becoming more of the curriculum police. And, um, and what we've really determined is that we've got to be much more aggressive about making sure that every single elementary school is using a effective curriculum and that the teachers are trained to that curriculum and equal, as equally important that all the teachers are on the same wavelength. So what is being done at kindergarten prepares the student for the instructional approach at first grade and what is done at first grade is being done at second grade and second grade at third grade. So that's the third thing we're doing and we're hoping this uh, CASA initiative which targets 200 of our underperforming elementary schools and goes in and literally uh, the, uh, you know, the intent of the program is to make sure that all of these schools are using a quality curriculum and that all the teachers are on the same wavelength and the teachers are, are teaching to that curriculum and they're trained to that curriculum. We think that that's going to help us, that's going to help us get over the hump. Okay?